it's pretty cool because I can genuinely say that I love and care for every single person in this room. And I'm pretty sure that I could say the same thing about most of y'all, right there, all of y'all. So where else would you get that? I mean, before I came here, I probably would have stole your wallet or something when you weren't looking now. We're all best friends. Um, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so, I know that's hard to believe, but unfortunately, it's pretty accurate. What do I do with this thing? I guess I put it here. Sorry, bear with me. Awkwardness is one of my charming qualities, so just go with it. I am. So, how is everyone this morning? Imagine that. Cool. So... Are you ready? Over the years, I have known many mighty warriors on fire for the Lord. And too many highly anointed, faithful servants suddenly switch out and go off the deep end. Normally it initiates with an offense over some carnal circumstance that hits them hard. Maybe they were disappointed. Maybe they did a dumb thing and were corrected. Maybe someone treated them in a way they didn't prefer. Maybe someone they looked up to just fell short. You know, basic everyday life circumstances. But instead of being warriors and fighting the voice of the stranger the way they were taught, they choose to feel sorry for themselves and harbor and feed their resentments. They justify their sin and they allowed it to push them over the edge, opening the door and letting the enemy take over. The word says all things work to the good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. But when you take your eyes off of God and put your eyes on self and feeling sorry for yourself during your affliction, it will not work to the good because you'll miss it because you'll be focusing on self instead of what you're supposed to learn. Offended people run straight past Jesus' healing and loving arms into a religious state of being. So... I'm calling this the religious TKO. It's a hard message, but someone's got to do it. Um, <laughs> a TKO is a technical knockout. It's a term used in boxing when a competitor is beat up so badly that they are deemed by the ref unable, to be unable to defend themselves properly due to a serious injury. They're often incoherent. Their eyes are swelled shut. Their jaw might be broken, so they can't speak. They can no longer fight. So for the sake of the game, they're rendered useless. And this is the phrase where throwing the towel comes from. So in a religious TKO, one is rendered not unconscious, but unable to function or move in the spirit. They're useless and defenseless. They stop fighting and let the voices take over and take them out of the game. A person can know God's word, but if their behavior and understanding doesn't line up, it's useless towards the kingdom of God. In fact, the very opposite happens, and the enemy uses them to spread deception and discord among the brethren, which brings shame to the name of the Lord. In Proverbs 17, 15, you don't have to go there. It says, he who justifies the wicked and he who contemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. If you truly love your brother or sister and have the love of Christ in your heart, you will tell them the truth when you see them going astray. The true love of God is being to risk someone being angry with you. Their well-being is more important to you than avoiding any inconvenience or unpleasant conversations. Why do we sit and keep our mouths shut when our brother is on the way to hell and destruction? Because we don't want to deal with being uncomfortable. It's easy to just smile in everyone's face and say, praise God. It's hard to speak truth and correct when someone is out of line, and it's a pain in the butt because you don't want to deal with the backlash and the aftermath and you know especially when they get offended and you have to deal with all that it's like no one wants to bother with that but even when I was preparing this message the enemy interfered much you know 
My flesh didn't want to do it, but I had to burn through it because it's the message that God wanted me to share. Mom Maureen told me many times that it's not about easy or hard. It's about righteousness. You know, trust that I'd much rather be up here talking about rainbows and sunshine with you today. But, you know, this is it. So hopefully you still love me when it's over. <laughs> I mean, honestly, Kate, Kate says that Holy Ghost whoopings are free, right? And um, she raised me up. But I was thinking about it, and, you know, the, the whoopings we get from the devil are not free. They have a very high price. So I'd rather get Holy Ghost whoopings all day long and be free than keep paying the enemy. I'm sick of doing that. The knowledge you receive during your time with this ministry is pure revelation from God's throne room. It's the most valuable gift you will ever receive in your lifetime. You have been granted access to the presence, power, and freedom of the Spirit of the living God. Too many miss it. They don't value it, and they allow it to slip through their fingers. With this opportunity that's been granted to you, there is a standard of accountability. You absolutely must stay saturated in his presence and you must practice the things which you have learned. Failure to do these righteous requirements will land you in a religious state of mind where you know God's word, but you can't do God's word. Knowledge puffed up or mixed with pride will lead you into a religious state of being. It's not about gathering and collecting all this knowledge. It's about applying the knowledge to your life. It's about knowing the person and sharing his presence with other people, not showing them how much you know and how brilliant you are and what scriptures and all that. Casual Christians lead to casualties. We all fall short in some areas, and it's very important when having issues never to listen to that voice who says you aren't part of the problem. I want to make certain that I'm not susceptible to the religious spirit because that thing gets on my nerves really bad for one thing, and God hates it, and I don't want to get taken out. I'm not above getting taken out just like anyone else. So we're supposed to seek and follow the Holy Spirit into our transformation. So I just dove right in to see what he would reveal to me. And these are some of the things that I, he showed me today. You know, there's certain things that God does not like, and it, his word makes it clear. So we better start not liking it too, because it's not about opinions. These are crazy times to be alive, and the reprobate, reprobate mind is taking over people all around us. I mean, the music, when I was growing up, the music wasn't great, and I'm sure, you know, it was definitely not holy, but the lyrics to the music that they release on kids to listen to is nullifying any kind of decency or you know, self-worth whatsoever. It's just pure lust and degrading disrespect. It's just this, an example of how society is degenerating. The world has become a strange place where unrighteous people are put on pedestals while righteous people are condemned, mocked, and laughed at. When Jesus was crucified, it was justification of the wicked. They condemned Jesus to death for no crime and justified it by setting Barabbas, a murdering psychopath, free. If you turn to Matthew 27, we can read about that. Time is it? All right. Matthew 27. One through 18. When the morning came, all the chief priests and elders of, of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. 
Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest took the silver and pieces and said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are price, the price of blood. So they're considered with the law, even though they're about to illegally crucify someone, that they're considered about the law, about the money. Anyway, um, and then they consulted together and bought with them the, the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, the field had been called the field of blood to this day. Then was filled what was spoken by Jeremiah the, pro, the, excuse me, Jeremiah the prophet, saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the value of him who was priced, whom they gave, whom they of the children of Israel priced and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed. Jesus, now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him saying, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, it is as you say. And while he was being accused to the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word so that the governor marveled greatly. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing the multitude one prisoner whom they had wished. And at this time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew that they handed him over because of envy. So envy was the ultimate reason that they wanted to get rid of Jesus. Now Jesus stood before, or excuse me, the Pharisees and Sadducees were not truly seeking after God, though they acted as if they were. Their ri religion was re ritualistic and empty, and it was preventing others from following the Messiah. However, the Pharisees and Sadducees had a good thing going on in their personal lives. They were rich, they had beautiful homes, high positions in society, power, respect, and they believed God was pleased with them because of these things. Until Jesus came in cramping their style, Jesus had miracles, signs, and wonders pouring out of him. He was just on fire for God. He was God. So people loved him, and he gathered large crowds. His teachings exposed the religious leader's sin and moral failures. The Pharisees had the same access to the word and to Jesus that everyone had. But instead of partaking and transforming in the areas of their life that were contrary they looked at everything carnally and chose to keep their tar carnal stature and materialism. They wanted that more than what God was offering them. They condemned God as Jesus to his face and were offended, jealous, envious, and hateful toward him. They were not men of honor. They literally did not honor God. So if you go to Matthew 23, you'll see why they were so upset. This passage is why relig religious leaders were so angry with Jesus. He was exposing their ridiculousness and speaking truth. A religious spirit will get real angry and offended with you when you speak pure Holy Ghost truth to them or expose them. You ready? Matthew 23, 1. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. Do not do, not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. So they tell people to do all the rules and instructions, but they feel like it doesn't apply to them. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. And I had to look that up because I'm like, what is a phylactery? It's like a headband with a box, and they put all their holy prayers in, in the box, and they literally wear it on their forehead like this. <laughs> 
So I guess they had, you know, they had the fancy garments over their head, and then that was part of their, like, prestigious outfit, I guess. So they have big ones, which meant they have a whole bunch of prayers and whatever in there. Bizarre. Anyway, that's definitely not the point <laughs> at all. Um, where am I? Okay. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greeting in the marketplace, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, and he who is in heaven. Do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ, but he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself to be exalted will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you receive the greater condemnation. Okay, let's stop there. A religious spirit, like you said, it blocks, it won't go in. A religious spirit blocks the Holy Spirit from entering a person in their mind. And then it uses them to block other people from entering in to the kingdom of God. It blocks the flow of the Holy Spirit with intimidation, its mouth and deception through the twisting of God's word. It refuses to get in line and blocks others' way by pointing them in a different direction. With a religious spirit, you work for God, but you don't work with him. We might notice this by an individual who blatantly breaks rules or gets out of order and claims or even insists that God commissioned them to do this thing. But they don't realize that being out of order makes them a bad example to those that they are taking under their wing. And if you continue in to verse 15, it says... Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. That's pretty harsh. So people with the religious spirit think that they have the better alternative to what God is saying to do, and they're leading people astray, even though they think they're helping them. And I don't want to do that. I don't know about y'all, but I don't want to do that to anybody. All right, on 16. Woe to you blind guides who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar is nothing, but whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift in the altar or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar, swear by it and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple, swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven, swear by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you paid the tithe of mint and, and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone, blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. So he, I think they're, he's calling, the, I would say a religious spirit, could blind you, being he said blind, like how many times? <laughs> You'd be blinded by a religious spirit. That's why you need to take a look and check it out. Don't just assume that it's not an issue. A religious spirit will carnalize spiritual matters and spiritualize things that don't matter. In other words, a religious spirit is petty. It will nitpick on small trivial matters of no profit magnifying and making them huge. A religious spirit will overlook and justify major kingdom violations if it fits their agenda. Like I said before, with a religious spirit, they work for God, so they say, but they don't work with him. All 
All right. Matthew 26. I'm getting cold now. Matthew twenty six fifty nine. Y'all still love me? Okay, cool. God still loves me. That's most important. Um, Matthew twenty six fifty nine. Now the chief, it's the the chief priests, the elders, and all the council saw false tense testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at least two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said I am able to destroy the temple and build it in three days, the temple of God and build it in three days. See, a religious spirit seeks out to collect others to agree with to agree with their vengeful agenda. A religious spirit is envious of the power of the anointing, but they can't stand the conviction. They are compelled to challenge, block, and contend. And if all else fails, they'll spread their message, their dead message, out like cancer to others. These religious leaders forced an illegal tribunal against Jesus. They were willing to go to any lengths to get rid of him. They went out of order back and forth to Rome and Pontius Pilate trying to force them to cooperate with their agenda. They violated more than 22 of their own laws and trampled much of their own doctrine in order to, keep, uh, order to force Jesus' crucifixion. We must be careful not to bypass or trample God and end up being taken captive by, by religion through self-justification. 2 Timothy 2. Second Timothy two fourteen. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved by God, a worker who does not need be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenius and Philetus are the, of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying this is, that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of the concerning, the faith of some, sorry. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having the seal. The Lord knows who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God would perhaps grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses, escaping the sarah of the devil, having been taken captive to do his will. See, it says, correcting those who are in opposition. We don't just sit there and listen to it. They're click like on it, we correct it. And it also says, if God perhaps will grant them the repentance so that they may know the truth. So that means we should be looking towards hoping that the person would repent and get in line. We're not like off with their head. They're annoying, you know. We want them to do a holy shift. <laughs> See, back in the Bible times, they had to etch messages in stone. 
or go ride off on donkeys and chariots to recruit followers. But it's so much easier now because we have Facebook and cell phones and text messages and other social media platforms where religious spirits love to post and comment and debate doctrine all day on there. It's all over. Oh, religious spirits love to get on Facebook and self-promote and argue and dispute doctrine and make their little point, get likes. Like, maybe before we do or say things, we should ask God, would you click like on this before I do it? I don't know. If not, then I'm not going to do it or say it. I had this certain season in my life that was heavily affected by this religious group called the Hebrew Israelites. So at that time, I wanted to learn whatever I could about them. It's a really big movement in New York City, in L.A., in Atlanta, Detroit, and in the prison system. If you've ever been to prison, you would be familiar with Hebrew Israelites. So I joined a few of their forums to try to get understanding so I could discern what I was dealing with which is really what the whole point of this teaching is about. Sometimes we need to gain understanding in order to help us with our discernment and compassion towards those who are behaving in strange and frustrating ways. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding are all attributes of the Holy Spirit, and we need as much as we can get. Anyway, um, the Hebrew Israelites are an extremely militant form of religious spirits. They have forums, forums of tens of thousands of people disputing doctrine back and forth all day on Facebook and YouTube. I mean, 35,000 members, it, it's crazy. And all they do is attack people and cuss them out over the word of God. It's the most disrespectful, sanctimonious religious group that I have ever encountered in my life. They think that the color of their skin deems them as God's chosen people and everyone else is worth nothing to God. They argue about things like if Jesus was dark or light, as if it makes any difference because he's no longer in the flesh and their religion doesn't even believe that he's God. So I don't know why they argue about this every day because it shouldn't matter to them either, but they do. I mean, it's, it's pretty diabolical. It, there's no freedom in this. It's all bondage, no love, only hypocrisy and the rec- accuser of the brethren. And many of, the, many of these men, because it's mostly like a men thing, they used to be devout Christians at one time, and they got led astray by, so they go out to the corners, and they go out to the inner cities and call people and try to recruit them, and they use doctrine twisted to like confront and contend with you and try to get you to believe that because of your ethnicity that you are God's chosen people. So they puff up your pride you know, because sometimes certain, in society, certain ethnicities have negative connotations with it. So it feels real good for someone to say, hey, by the way, because of this thing that has given you a hard time in life, now you're, it means you're God's chosen person, chosen people, who wouldn't want to believe that. So it's pretty crazy. But um, that's just a little bit about that. Um, See, mature adults in their right state of mind do not care what anybody says about them in real life or on Facebook or YouTube. They don't care. It doesn't matter to them. I've, me- I've seen many great and powerful men and women of God that teach truth get slandered in real life and on social media platforms. And they don't give a hoot. It's not stopping God's plan for their life. And even taking it a step further, nowadays, the corrupt owners of the social media platforms themselves, if, you're too mu- if you have too much of an audience following you and there's too much truth going on, they will censor you, they will shadow ban you, they will deactivate your account, they will remove your videos, and that's the people that owned the social media platforms. So even if they're not Christians, they still have that religious spirit frame of mind where they're going to shut the door from, and block from anybody learning about anything other than what they want. The word says, touch not my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. What this means is we are, we are to respect and honor men and women of God, even if we have a disre- disagreement. 
There is a right way and a wrong way to do things. Righteous men and women can get their point across without being disrespectful or slandering. If your best resolution to conflict in the kingdom is to go back to your old man and your thoughts, words, and deeds, all that is doing is exposing your immaturity and pride. We must develop some conflict resolution skills while we're here. Addicts have no conflict resolution skills, which is essentially why they never, whenever something bad happens, they can't handle it. They go out and drink or get high or do something stupid. So while especially people in the program or living at the ministry, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Learn how to have a dis healthy disagreement with somebody. You don't have to agree with every single thing that I say or every single thing someone else says in order to be th their brother or sister. It's okay to disagree, but there's a healthy and respectful way that you can discuss it, and there's a way that leads to hell. And we don't want to go to hell. We don't want to bring hell into other people's life. We want to be free. I think we all do. Um, as you advance in the kingdom, your battles become more intense and more complex. Pastor says, new level, new devil. We must always remember that all of us fall short. We must forgive mistakes and offenses and avoid bitterness from taking root in our hearts. That's our job. Not everyone's going to go out of their way to make sure that they don't hurt your feelings or step on your toes. I mean, some people are considerate, but mostly not. And we got to learn how to like deal with it, keep it moving. I mean, you're going to get upset every day of your life. Like, if you're offended every day, then you should check that out <laughs> for sure. Never discount all of somebody's positive attributes over a few areas that you believe a person could have done better. God uses donkeys. Trust God. Sow mercy, reap mercy. Sow bitterness, reap bitterness. To be free or not to be free? That is the question. Romans 8, 1. Ready? Free from indwelling sin. It's like the secret recipe to not be in bondage. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that he was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son into the likeness of sinful flesh, an account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the spirit, or to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So if you're in the flesh, you cannot please God. The carnal mind is magnetized towards reacting in the flesh to sow in the flesh. So you can charge more debt to the kingdom of hell. So you can reap for it later. So on to nine, but if, verse nine, but you are not in the f flesh, but in the spirit. And if de indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, now anyone does not have the spirit of Christ. He is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead also Give, li give life to your mortal body through this, his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live according to the spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. 
Some of us are stuck in the perpetual cycle of sowing continual debt to the flesh. It's like a charge account or open tab with hell. The interest rates are high. We need to give it up and file bankruptcy. Just let the whole thing go. Start over. Clean the slate. I mean, that's how, when I came to Total Freedom, that's what I had to do. I had to get rid of all my carnal debts and all my emotional debts and damage and just wipe it away. Get rid of it. I couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't fix it. I just had to let it go and let God take care of it. When I, when I came to Total Freedom, I had to give up my life and all the bondage and debt I had accrued. My carnal worldly debts and my spiritual ones, I had to cut them all loose. It was the only way to be free. I also learned that I had to give up my worldly right to act out in the flesh if I wanted to be free from torment. I had to give up my right to be offended, jealous, envious, and the rest because these things waste time and destroy your soul. See, the world encourages and even entices you to pet and feed your flesh and God commands you to kill it. Our flesh is a coward, and it doesn't want to do anything uncomfortable, not even for God. Galatians 5. The works of the flesh are the root of our bondages. Now, the works of the flesh are evident which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The main difference between envy and jealousy is that envy is the emotion of coveting what someone else has, while jealousy is the emotion related to fear that someone, something or someone you have will be taken away by someone else. Covetousness is an evil, strong, or inordinate desire of obtaining, possessing, or achieving something without regard to law or justice. These are some of the main motivating factors in the reasons why the Pharisees or the religious spirits do the things that they do. And like I said before, it helps me to understand where people are coming from and what's motivating them to behave the way that they do. It helps me with my compassion and understanding and maybe able to help guide them in a better way if they want help. I mean, you can only help people that ask for help. You can't help anybody that doesn't ask for help besides praying for them, which is help, but... You know what I mean. People do dumb and crazy things when they're under offense, jealousy, and envy. If we can learn to recognize this in ourselves and others, we will walk in more understanding and compassion of others. We could overcome evil with love, not overcome evil with more evil stacked on top of it. This is nothing new. It all started in heaven with Lucifer being jealous and envious towards the Father. And it's discussed throughout the Bible from cover to cover. If you go to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, 12. We've read this before. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, the lowest depths of the pit. Lucifer was thrown out of heaven and started this whole battle by his prideful jealousy towards God. Can you even imagine being so prideful that you were jealous of God Almighty and putting yourself in a place of equality, decreeing to elevate yourself above him? He had everything anyone could desire, and it still wasn't good enough for him. Jealousy was also the fruit that led to the initial fall of man in the garden. 
the serpent voice is telling us we're missing out on something or something's being withheld from us all the time. We all have the capacity to be susceptible to harboring jealousy. It's in our flesh, according to the works of the flesh. It's speaking to us. Even Isaiah, I mean, with his little pure and innocent heart, the other day he came home from school and he said, all the other kids in the class got a new book and I didn't get a new book. And I said, why not? He goes, I don't know, because I did something bad. So I asked the teacher, I said, apparently Isaiah didn't get advanced to the next book because he did something wrong. Can you please let us know what it is so we can work on it? And she said, actually, it's quite the opposite. Isaiah is ahead by three books from the rest of the class, and there's no more books left to give him. So we're going to put him on first grade books, if that's okay with you. So in his little mind, he thought he was missing out because everyone else got a new book and he didn't, but he's way ahead. So that's, you know, that's the type of, our mind thinks worse first or assumes that we're missing out when really we're getting blessed probably and we don't even know it. If you go to um, Samuel, 1 Samuel, We're going to talk about Saul resenting David and behaving very strangely. 1 Samuel 18. First Samuel 18, 5 through 16. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul sent him over the men of war. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people, also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now it happened that they were coming home. As they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the woman had come out of the city singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. The women sang as they danced and said, Saul had slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was very angry and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands and to me they have ascribed only one thousand. Now, Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul. And he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand as at the other times. But there was a spear in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. Now Saul was afraid of God because the Lord was with him and he departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and made him captain over a thousand and went out and came in before the people. And David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Therefore, then, when Saul saw that David behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all of Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. Now, it said here, Saul was plagued by God with an evil spirit because he opened the door through jealousy and envy over comparing himself to David. Keep in mind that Saul committed continual disobedience against the Lord, which led to David being anointed as king, probably. And David even helped Saul through these afflictions with the evil spirits and other ones. Saul continued to try to kill him the whole time. Jealousy and envy contaminates a faithful heart. David had a faithful heart. Saul did not. Saul tried to kill David at least, 20, uh, at least 12 times because of his jealousy and insecurity over David's anointing and favor from God. Saul was so blinded to all that he had, in the end it meant nothing to him. He was blinded to all the mistakes which led God to turn the kingdom over to David. Jealousy drove Saul into such madness and delusion, which contributed to a series of mistakes and casualties, and finally the loss of his sons, and finally, suicide. 
And you can read about that in First Chronicles 10. Jealousy is the worst manifestation of rejection. A jealous spirit has to win. It will not let go, even if it means alienating everyone in their entire life. Jealousy and envy blinds Christians to develop a system of legalism or false spirituality. This is a religious spirit breeding ground for self, justifying a self-seeking and evil countenance. They rather prove their exposure wrong instead of just doing the work to get right. Why be jealous of someone else's anointing? Why not do the work and get your own? Why, we should stop envying what other people have if we haven't gone through or we're not willing to go through what they did to get it. But in the meantime, the Lord used Saul to burn the characteristics of Saul out of David so he could be a better king. So if you don't like Saul, then don't be like Saul. If you don't like the way someone treats you, then don't treat others poorly. And if you want people to respect you, then you must respect them or they won't. Jealousy leads to death and murder. If you go to Genesis 4, there's a lot about this, and I tried to condense and jam as much in as I can. It's not a quick, simple teaching like Pastor says. <laughs> it's like the opposite. Genesis 4, 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, and this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit, to the ground, uh, fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought a firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel in his offering, but he did not respect Cain in his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And it is, its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass that then when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive, a fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. See, jealousy and envy causes people to obsess with their negative emotions and mentally justify sinful behavior. Cain wasn't even sorry that he killed his own brother. He immediately jumped into how his consequences from God would affect him negatively and started complaining. Jealousy is impervious to the pain or harm that they generate or perpetuate towards others. James 3. James 3.13 Who is wise in understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter and envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but it is earthly, sensual, and demonic. So where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Willing to yield. It's like when you're at one of those blinking yellow lights, 
you don't just smash the gas and hope for the best. You take a minute, and maybe not a whole minute, 20 seconds. Or look around. Make sure there's no cars coming. Make sure you're not going to run someone over. You're yielding. You're being cautious of what's going on before you make a decision on what to do. When you're operating in anxiety because, you know, envy and jealousy and that stuff makes you anxious, you got to, like, do something now. You smash the gas and bad things can happen. Most people play around with God and they don't take it seriously. They don't really respect him or they wouldn't do what they do. It's all about taking an honest look in the mirror and conquering everything that is not of Christ within you. It's about cleansing, cleaning out every vestige or remnant of evil. The question is, do you want that? We are supposed to be accommodating the Holy Ghost to live within us, not the other way around. We're becoming a vessel fit for the master's use. If we want to be righteous and pleasing to God, we must cancel every flesh-pleasing or self-promoting motive. This is how you harvest the divine nature within. God is a reciprocating God. If you do this, then he will do this. And that is your re- part of your relationship with him. And he's always asking us every day to do something. Pastor says we're supposed to ask him what he wants us to do every morning. I'm here to tell you that this does work, and I am living proof. If you do what you have learned, you will be set free according to God's word. Some people come back to this program two and three times saying it didn't work. But truth be told, they never did what they were taught to do in the first place. They only pick and chose a few things, and then they fall away. They will say, it's this person's fault, or that house manager was mean to me, blah, blah. But really, there's no excuse for this. The true problem is people are too lazy or stubborn to do the work. We can't fix you. We can't fix you. You have to do the work. We cannot surrender for you. We cannot maintain your deliverance for you, and we cannot secure your eternity for you. That is on you. We teach you how to get set free. You have to actually get set free yourself. We show you the way, but you have to do the work. And if you don't do the work, you won't get set free. And if you don't walk it out, you won't stay set free. And it's not anyone else's fault. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Holy Ghost weapons are free. Um, Second Peter 2. Oh, this is sealed the deal. Um, <laughs> compromising and cherry picking God's word will lead you into a religious state of being. This is exactly how dest- dest- bleh, destructive doctrines are established within us. Ready? All right. But there were also false prophets among the people. And even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood of, on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing the lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and reserve the unjust their punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lusts of uncleanness and despise authority, they are presumptuous self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring reviling accusation against them before the Lord. But these, like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deception while they feast with you. 
having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart change in covetous practices and are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure the, through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption by whom a person is overcome. By him also he is brought into bondage. For if they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior of Jesus Christ, they, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end for them is worse than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and is so having washed in her wallowing in the mire. Snap. <laughs> if we don't learn to deal with offense, envy, and jealousy, it will destroy us. Last week in the news, I read two stories. One my husband showed me. This married man shot 94 shots at his ex-girlfriend's new boyfriend in a jealous rage. And the guys didn't die still, but that's, he sh ended up shooting him in the butt somehow. 94, you just, can you, how much jealousy and rage do you have in you if you're shooting someone 94 times? That's pretty crazy. And then this one's my personal favorite. This lady stabbed her husband because she saw a picture of him in his phone with a younger, thinner, and more attractive woman. Come to find out later, after she stabbed him, it was him and her together from years ago before they were married. He came across the picture in an old email and downloaded it into his phone. So she was scrolling through his phone. She's like, who is that? Oh, no. And, you know, went ballistic. And then come to find out, it was him. Or, Yeah. That is what je jealousy does to people. <laughs> it's crazy. So what's the solution here? <laughs> Become aware and we search our own fruit. When we are having issues, we never listen to the thoughts that refuse the possibility that I am part of the problem. <laughs> We must deal with the enemy within ourselves. Deal with insecurity. Seek counsel from those who will call you out, not those who will agree with you. Choose gratitude and contentment. Keep our emotions in check. Desire his plan. Surrender and step into it and know that you are in it and trust what happens, be it blessing, rebuke, or otherwise. All things work to the good for those who are love him and are called. And the only way that you can be a good teacher is if at first you are a good learner. Because you can't teach others to learn unless you know how to learn well. In Luke 9.23, we don't have to go there, but we've all talked about this a million times. The nice self, pick up cross, follow the formula for being a disciple in your conversion. So deny self selfish thoughts and ambitions, deny jealousy, envy, covetousness, offense, deny your impulse to manifest in the flesh, pick up cross, deal with what's on your table, accept your circumstances as your cross to bear, and follow the Holy Spirit's leading on how to get you through your circumstances and through your ungodly emotions without sinning. We trust God, not fear. We walk in love and forgiveness. We let our offenses go so we can be free. And I think I'm almost done. Wow. Romans 8. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work 
together for the good to those who love God and those that are according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, who he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own sons, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? For who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all things we are more than conquerors for him, through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for your victory. And we just ask you in the name of Jesus right now that you would remove anything in us that doesn't line up with you. I ask that you would spark a desire in us to surrender anything that is not of you, that's within us. Help us to see it. Help us to get free. Help us to help others. Put compassion in our heart towards our brethren, Lord. Remove any jealousy or envy or wickedness from us. Find our mind to your mind. Find our thoughts and our words and our actions to your will. Please activate the divine nature within us. Remove all scales and veils from our eyes and our hearts. Give, just give us the desire to give it up and transform into what you've called us to be, Lord. I bind every coward cur or spirit interfering with our courage to step into righteousness and out of deception. And I command those spirits to loose and leave us. I bind every spirit of jealousy, envy, religion, and cowardice, and I command it to loose and leave the people of God. I bind every spirit of offense. I command it to loose and leave us, and I just ask that you would fill every empty area with your love, your joy, your peace, and your willingness to yield. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.